By the end of this video, you will have a concrete Zettelkasten system and workflow to use in Obsidian. You'll understand the history, benefits, and practicalities of using a Zettelkasten, as well as the philosophy behind it so you can transform your system and process it to fit your needs. I'm gonna take you through an overview of my entire Zettelkasten Obsidian workflow. I'm gonna show you how I capture, organize, distill, and express information. Afterward, you will transcend into the astral plane itself as your ideas transfer across the globe and dominate all of your opposition in a glorious display of power and Okay, I, I might have gone a little carried away there. Before we talk about the modern day Zettelkasten, it's important to understand the history because it can give us insight into how we use the Zettelkasten today. So the Zettelkasten note-taking system is most well known because it was popularized by Sanke Ahrens in his book, How to Take Smart Notes, where he discusses the prolific writing output of German note-taker named Nicholas Luhmann, who used an analog and physical Zettelkasten method. So the way that he did this was he wrote notes on physical slip cards, which he called Zettels. Each Zettel was organized like this. It would have a unique ID at the top, then some content or the main idea that formed the bulk of the note. And then finally a footer slash reference slash related section where he would go out and connect to other notes. So after completing a Zettel, he would put it into his slip box. Instead of organizing his slip box through a rigid folder structure, Lumen gave each of his Zettels a unique ID, which he wrote at the top. Then he would connect them together in one of two ways. Either he would physically put them together in the slip box, or he would reference a physically separate but related note with its identifier at the bottom of the slip that we mentioned up here. When he organized physically, he would start with a higher order concept or topic, something very broad, and then slowly add zettles in a chain by adding new letters and numbers in front of them. So he might start with a higher order note on the history of bonsai trees with an 11 at the top, and then his next note, if related, would be titled 11A. 11B might be related to 11, but not as much to 11A, whereas 11A2 would would be related to both 11a and 11. So compounding on this many, many iterations allowed him to create a hierarchy of zettles related in a chain like this. As you can see, it just goes down. So many connections. But what if a zettle connected in the chain physically connected to another note outside the chain? Say 11c10 was connected to 26a3. Then Lumen could reference the unique identifier at the bottom of the note or in the body of the note itself. The unique identifier could be a number, title, time-based, or something else. Lumen would also add in the literature note reference where he got his ideas from at the footer slash bottom of the note so he could always trace back his steps and find the original source. These two organizational methods allowed Lumen to break through the folder-based rigid structure so many people still take notes like today. Instead, he could connect related concepts across disciplines. And he might connect an idea from evolutionary biology to one on the history of Asian trade across the Silk Roads. It's no wonder he was so prolific. Each day he could just walk into his office next to a slip box and ask the simple question, what should I write today, Zettelkasten? Just to be clear, he didn't literally stand in front of his Zettelkasten and say that. That would be weird. Very weird. His slip cards naturally clumped together to form writing topics, but also connected in strange, insightful ways that could lead to questions of inquiry coming up naturally rather than being forced from the get go. And because each slip card had a reference back to the original source on the back, he could always cite his resources when the writing came. Add it all up, this made Nicholas Lumen one of the most prolific writers of his time, publishing works ranging from law, economy, politics, art, religion, ecology, mass media, and love. But his most incredible skill was his ability to instill imposter syndrome in the minds of everyone who was exposed to him. Just talking about him makes me feel insecure about my own note-taking methods. Joke's on Lumen though, because in the modern era, we have power unlike he could ever imagine with digital note-taking tools. These tools like Obsidian, Rome Research, LogSeq, and more make the linking nature of the Zettelkasten easier than ever before. 
a super brief history of Zettelkasten before Lumen. Despite Lumen being the face of the Zettelkasten method of note taking, it actually has a much broader history than just from him. In his article, The Two Definitions of Zettelkasten, Chris Aldrich discusses the deep history and knowledge often just swept under the rug by the plethora of YouTubers and bloggers, definitely <clears throat> not including me, discussing how to use one. <laughs> Since antiquity, writers, scientists, and other creators have used commonplace books, which are notebooks that typically hold quotes, thoughts, and ideas in books that resonate with their authors. This practice is closely related to the keeping of florilegiums in Christian settings, which were collections of literary extracts. In the 16th century, Swiss physician Conrad Gesner, building on the commonplace tradition, realized that one's notes or excerpts might be easier used if they were cut out of their places on the page and rearrangeable. So Lumen wasn't the first one to use the Zettelkasten-esque note-taking method. And before the Zettelkasten method and paper even existed, humans had to take notes on wood or stone. Heck, before that, we were entirely oral storytellers. I say this because it's easy to get caught in the weeds when beginning to use the Zettelkasten method of note taking. Where should I connect this note? How should I title the note? What is the meaning of life? That last one might be a little unrelated. But humans have survived without digital note taking and the Zettelkasten method for thousands of years. The tool is only as strong as the person that wields it. You give a tank to a chipmunk and see how much use they make of it. Similarly, you try to ingrain a Zettelkasten note-taking method without having the right mindset or goals, and it won't do much for you. You might be saying, Aiden, all this seems really complicated and like an utter waste of time. That's a good point. Why am I writing this article or making this video? All right, bye guys. In all seriousness, the Zettelkasten note-taking method has some serious benefits if you learn to integrate it into your life. Let's go through some of the main ones now. The first is top-down and bottom-up note-taking. The Zettelkasten method allows you to research both top-down and bottom-up. You can research top-down by coming to your Zettelkasten with a question already in mind, and then you look for notes in your system relevant to the question at hand. But you could also come to your Zettelkasten with a bottom-up approach. Instead of asking a research question, you ask your Zettelkasten what you would like to research by analyzing the clumps and connections between notes something I will discuss how to do more effectively later on. Fights confirmation bias. By taking up a bottom-up approach to note-taking, we can potentially fight confirmation bias because we don't come with a pre-crafted research question looking to confirm something. Rather, we ask our Zettelkasten what our research is telling us in the connections and clumps between notes. It fights perfectionism. The fundamental unit of the Zettelkasten method is the note or Zettel. And treating the note as the fundamental unit of research output fights perfectionism. Many academics I know can feel unproductive during the literature review stage of research. But if you're taking notes during your research in your own words, then you're by definition still being productive. How is an article made? By assembling notes together because the creative process is an act of assemblage. It follows then that creation, connecting, and assembling of notes is the fundamental part of the writing process itself. It creates a unique knowledge base. The way you connect ideas together will naturally differ from person to person because of your unique ideaverse. To learn about what an ideaverse is, check out Nick Milo's video up above. You have an entirely different perspective which grows from your unique genetics and background. This allows you to create your own infinite library and avoid falling into the trap of the cookie cutter student, the student who only falls in note taking principles rather than note making. When I look around me at the students at Cornell, I see students writing notes only from the professor verbatim and never connecting notes between lectures or classes. This leads to their knowledge base becoming cookie cutter versions of all other students taking notes in the same way. And it takes the joy out of learning and note taking. They don't feel any connection to what they are making because it doesn't have any of their personality inside of it. Now we're finally ready to talk about how I've created this system inside of my own vault. First, I'm gonna give an overview of my workflow using a drawing I made inside of Excaladraw. Then I'm gonna talk about the different types of notes in my system as they form up the bulk of my Zettelkasten. We'll move on to my access folder structure, which I have integrated from Nick Milo's fantastic video on the structure that you can watch in more detail up above. And finally, I'll discuss how I capture, organize, distill, and express using my system. So let's look at my Zettelkasten workflow. Up here, 
you can see that the first step involves capture. Now, what can I capture? Well, I can capture fleeting thoughts, which just go straight into Obsidian. I can capture tasks, which go straight to my Todoist app. Voice memos, I use otter.ai. It's a really nice voice transcription service that you can use free and get most of the benefits from because you have totally audio hours to use. I also capture thoughts in my first brain. That's right, not everything needs to go into your second brain. Some things can just stay in your first brain. In fact, a lot of things can stay in your first brain. I capture calendar items in my Google Calendar. And finally, I capture content ideas in Notion where I have a whole Notion template from Thomas Frank that I use for creating content. Now for journaling, I capture things in my Obsidian daily notes, where then those daily notes get turned into weekly reviews, monthly reviews, and yearly reviews, while I'll go over those daily notes and reflect on my life, pretty much. I have a whole video up above about how I do daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly reviews, which you can watch up above. And then obviously the bulk of my capture is highlights. Where do I take highlights from? Well, I take them from Kindle app with books, Air app with podcasts, a podcast transcription service that literally allows you to take highlights of podcasts, which is sick. Audible books. I will say for PDFs, I use Zotero because I think it is such a good reference manager and it doesn't have the power for PDFs that I have seen from Reader, which I will discuss now. Reader, I use to capture my email newsletters, my articles that I read, peanut butter, <laughs> yes. YouTube videos, tweets, and I have a whole video about how I use Reader up above, which you can watch. And Reader collects all of the highlights from these four mediums, and these three mediums right here, they all get sent into Readwise, which is a highlight capture service that takes my highlights and sends them over to Obsidian automatically. I don't have to do this. And it includes all of this metadata, uh, which is essentially code at the top off the bat, which is really, really great. And I use Readwise official plugin in Obsidian to get that sync to work. And then the Obsidian citations plugin I use for Zotero. Oh, lastly, I also capture things into my Google Drive cloud storage things like files that I need to share with others. Uh, Obsidian is not a great app to share files with others. It is a great app to share ideas with others and come up with ideas, not to share files. And then I get to the organized step. Now the organized step, I use the access folder structure, which once again, I said, Nick Milo has a fantastic video on that. I'll explain it really briefly, but his video is much more in depth. So I have these folders for that. The calendar organizes all of my weekly reviews, monthly reviews, yearly reviews, daily notes and the reason I have a line here and the calendar goes all the way up back to the Google Calendar and then lifestyle design lifestyle design is the art of making the best average day for you and by going through these reviews in my calendar I can see from my reviews what activities do I enjoy doing the most what things bring spark energy and curiosity in my day? What things do I hate doing? What goals am I pursuing? What things do I want to pre-schedule into my Google Calendar going off of my reviews that I think will create good days for my future self? And you can watch more of how lifestyle design works in the video I mentioned earlier about journaling. So then what happens to all these notes or ideas inside of these folders? Well, that's where the distill process comes in. And this is where the different types of notes in my Zettelkasten come into play. I'll explain what they are more in depth later, right after this workflow actually. But broadly, they come in as fleeting notes or literature notes, which then get turned into atomic notes slash Zettels, which then get turned into evergreen notes slash permanent notes, which then finally get turned into my maps of content. And these, all of these notes combine in awesome ways to form my expression, which is on my YouTube channel, my digital garden, which is a published version of my Obsidian Vault that you can check out in the description down below. You should explore that. It is, it's a doozy. Uh, I made it. <laughs> my, my newsletter, Aiden's Infinite Play. And then finally, my podcast, Personal Knowledge Management with Aiden Halfont. It doesn't literally get turned into my podcast. It just gets turned into the questions and the answers that I might ask inside of my podcast. So now that we know my workflow, let me just zoom out so you can see it from a broad view. Isn't that so cool? This is with the Excaladraw plugin, by the way. It is a, a sick plugin that lets you create 
movable drawings. With all this content being created inside of the personal knowledge community, especially about Zettelkasten, and it can be really confusing on what the different notes in your system should be labeled. So I'll try my best to find the main note types I've heard and how they integrate into my Zettelkasten workflow so it's not confusing. So first we have fleeting notes, which are just passing thoughts that you have throughout your day. They're usually one or two sentences long and exist only to remind you of an idea. I usually write them down uh, as you saw my workflow on my daily note, but if I don't process them within two days of creation, I'll probably forget what they mean. Then we have literature notes. These are your notes from various pieces of information you consume, like podcasts, academic papers, books, etc. These are the highlights that come in from Readwise sources folder that await to be summarized and processed into other types of notes. Then we have atomic notes and zettles, the bedrock of my Zettelkasten. These are the notes you create from your literature notes. And the reason I had to say atomic notes and zettles is because I've heard them said both ways all the time in the PCAM community. I think zettles is a little bit more specific to Zettelkasten, but I'm not certain. Whereas atomic notes is more just broad to all of PCAM. But the essential thing is that these notes are written in your own words and contain references back to the original literature note if they have one. In addition, they're so atomic in their idea that they make sense even out of context of the literature notes from which they come. So this doesn't mean they're the only idea, but rather that there is a single focal point idea with background supporting ideas and evidence. And this decontextualized nature is what allows you to connect them to other notes in your system because they can make sense in other notes. Finally, we have permanent notes and evergreen notes. These are evolved atomic notes and zettles, which you've gone back to, fleshed out, and heavily connected to other parts of your system. I think permanent notes is the more Zettelkasten term, but evergreen notes is the one I hear spread a lot more outside of the community. They're kind of the same thing. They're the most valuable notes in your system by far. Enough time has passed for them to benefit from the Lindy effect, an effect that states the future life expectancy of something is directly proportionate to how long it's already been around. So for example, for example, a book which has been out for five decades can be expected to be around for another five decades. In our case, a note that has been in your system for a long time is more likely to be fleshed out, true, and serve as a foundational part of your thinking. Finally, we have maps of content, which are a summation of a bunch of other notes. It could be Zettel's, they could be Atomic Note, well, those are the same thing. They could be fleeting notes even. They could be evergreen notes, permanent notes. And they act as navigation centers and guiding posts to all other notes inside of them. They're the most important and useful notes in your system. I have an entire video where I describe in depth my process for creating them, which you can check out up above. So setting up the access folder structure. Now that we know what the different types of notes are, where are they stored inside of my sitting vault? I'm gonna press this beforehand saying this folder structure might not work for you. You almost certainly find things that you wanna change over time, which is completely absurd. What the hell is wrong with you? How could you even consider my system isn't the best ever created? I encourage you to find things that you differ on and implement them. Share what you figure out in the comments. I would love to read them. If you're reading this online, I would suggest you watch this section in the YouTube video up above instead of through writing as it's way easier to show through video format. If you're already watching on video, hello. <laughs> The folder system I'm using is not original. As I've said previously, it's out of inspiration from Obsidian community member Nick Milo's Access Obsidian Framework. Highly recommend you check out his original video. I'm gonna quickly summarize what each folder's for. If I open up my folder over here, you can see that I have the Access folder set up and Broadly, the encounter folder up here helps me develop passing thoughts and growing ideas because it contains all of my newly created, likely fleeting notes. As you can see, there are a lot of them. Atlas helps me gather, develop, and navigate ideas. It contains my maps of content, dashboard, overviews, logs, and data scopes. As you can see right here, boom, all my maps of content. A calendar helps me log, track, and review what matters to me. It contains my time-based information like daily notes, meetings, plans, reviews, and journals. So as you can see here, my goodness, all my reviews, daily, monthly, weekly, yearly. Don't have any meetings I'm in, thankfully. And cards, nope, it's not for poker. It is the main part of my Zellocast and it helps me build and connect my ideas because it contains all of my ideas, insights, people notes, concept notes, and quotes. So if I open this up, people folder, quotes folder, and Oh my God, this is where all of my notes are. So that's probably my biggest folder. And then we have extras, which helps me keep my support material handy. It contains attachments, graphics, images, manuals, and templates. Boom. 
Sources helps me build my external library of ideas. It contains my literature notes on articles, books, podcasts, research papers, courses, talks, everything. Yeah, so as you can see, it has my paper, my videos, Readwise with podcasts, tweets, books, and articles. It's got all my sources. And then finally, Spaces, which helps me keep track of my most important areas of, that's a lot of life, areas of life like schoolwork and content creation. So if I go here, I have my academic articles from college, my uni courses. And then I also have my content creation where I has all my writings and YouTube videos and also all of my newsletters that I've written for Aiden's Infinite Play. And then finally, my home note, which helps me see my system from the broadest level view. It contains all of my highest order mocks, which link out to lower order mocks. So if we click on that, you can see it has all of my most essential research interests, which are personal knowledge management, the flow state, happiness, lifestyle design, decision-making. That has my motivation station, 12 favorite questions, inspiration machine, my main sense-making. This is where I can make sense of the notes that I have created, like the encounter box. It takes very recently made notes, as you can see, days alive, my fleeting notes, and provides a place for me to look at them. And then we have my main research interests, like flow state, this is a whole mock about the flow state, which I highly recommend you check out on my published site. So now I know what types of notes and my folder system for organizing them. What does this workflow look like on the day to day? Let me take you through how I capture, distill, organize, and express my notes. So the first step is capture. Capturing is the process by which I take information from outside information mediums and combine it with my own thinking to create fleeting notes and literature notes. You see all the mediums I do this in through the Scala draw that I had shown earlier, but how do I know what to capture? I've discussed this in lots of my other videos and content, but I'm gonna roughly summarize my main tips here. The number one rule is to capture what resonates. If it makes your heart beat faster, your pupils dilate, that is a good sign. Next is to capture what confuses you. If it's surprising, it's probably important. Next is to find a capture toolkit. This is a set of information consumption mediums you stick to because you know they give you the highest quality of information. So my capture toolkit, for instance, is mostly books, articles, in podcasts, conversations. Everything else I don't capture from as much. I would like to get more into academic articles, but I don't really capture that much from Twitter, from Instagram, <laughs> if that's a place you can capture. I stick to the stuff I know is good. And I also defined my 12 favorite questions, which are a series of 12 questions that I use as guiding lights to what knowledge I gravitate towards and what activities I do in my day. So if I click on here, it has my 12 favorite questions. And every weekly review I have, I go through these and read them. So it primes me to know what to capture throughout my day. Talked about Readwise earlier. You can actually get an affiliate link for Readwise in the description for a lot off so that you can also seamlessly capture notes. So what is the note template that I use most of the time when I'm creating these fleeting notes, when I'm creating pretty much any atomic note or, or Zettel. It's the new note template. This is what I use almost all the time. And I'm gonna take you through each of the parts. Now, don't force this note template on yourself. This is just the one I use. I do think it is quite good, but it's entirely up to you. So the first section we have is this up section right here. So here, whenever I create a new note, I like to think of what note is related to this directly above this note. And I really like doing that and I'll link out to it because then when I go into a note, uh, let's say I go into my flow state Goldilocks zone. Okay, now here's the up section and it goes straight to the flow state because the Goldilocks zone is very related to the flow state, it's related down. So if I'm in this note, I can very easily be like, okay, now I'm in the flow state. Oh, now I wanna go home, boom, now I'm home again. And that lets me navigate my vault very easily. Now, I'm gonna explain the tags later, but then I have the title, just takes the title of the actual note. I have a the body of the note right here, which is this is where I'll write what it is I wanna write. And the reason I have this little code block right here is this is actually code where if I press Alt F, probably put my mouse cursor here. So my mouse cursor is here, I press Alt F, and my mouse cursor now moves to where the tp.file cursor is. So that's really helpful because when I'm in the note, I can write anywhere I want. I can do the up thing. And then as soon as I begin wanting to write the content of the note, boom, now I'm at the content of the note. Then down here, very much in inspiration of Nicholas Lumen's 
way of creating the Zettles. I have a related section at the bottom, which is where I link out to related notes that I didn't link in the body. And then I also have a resource section down here. And this is where I put any of the, where the sources where I got my information from. Now I might use footers. What's a good example of where I use footers? So these are some atomic note from an academic article that I created. And down here I have a footer which goes and links out to the actual resource or study where I got this from. Now, sometimes I will in the footer link to the note of the article, and sometimes I will just link to the citation. It really depends on what I think makes more sense for the source. So for instance, if I go up to, let's go to flow state. As you can see, one of my resources was Flow, The Psychology Optimal Experience, which is a book. Now, I didn't link to the citation for that. I linked instead to the entire book itself because I knew that if I was on a note like this, for one reason or another, I decided it would be better to link to the actual page with a note so I could see my original, the original book instead of just the citation. Because if I just put the citation, I wouldn't be able to go to the actual original page. It's really up to you to decide. But I usually like to use footers instead of just linking inside the body with parentheses because I think it looks so much more aesthetic if the body of the note isn't riddled with links unless those links are directly related. If they are only semi-related, I put them right here at the related section so they don't clutter up the note. Finally, I have these tags. What the heck are these tags? Well, I use tags mainly to show the state of a note in my system. So if I go over to my tag taxonomy, you can see all the tags that I use inside of my system. There's the inbox tag, there's seedlings, ferns, evergreen, and maps of content. So see the, uh, the inbox tag is given to any note in my sources folder that comes in from Readwise. It comes in automatically with a an inbox tag, and that means it hasn't been processed yet. So I know if I've seen an article with that, it hasn't been processed. Now, once I've processed it, I made notes out of it or whatever else I wanted to use for, I get rid of the inbox tag. And then new notes that I made, as you saw, my new note template had the seedling tag right here. These are notes that need to be fleshed out and connected to other notes. And then I have my fern tag, which is what I put on a note if I've gone back to it relatively many times. I've decently fleshed it out and I've connected to it, but it could still use more connections. And then evergreen notes are notes I've really fleshed out, deeply connected them. I've seen them many times. They're the foundation of my knowledge. And then finally, maps of content, which are summary notes that contain links to a bunch of other interrelated and connected notes. There's one tag that I didn't put here because it's very rare I have one like this. And that is my boat tag, <laughs> as you can see. So this is, a, this is my boat box for my home. Uh, this is a place where all the notes with no links go. So if I make a fleeting note and I literally have so little time, say I make a new note untitled and I'm like, no time, can't, can't connect, then I might literally just write some stuff and then I'll tag it with a uh, boat emoji. Yep, there it is, no time, can't connect. Uh, and that way, if I ever want to connect some notes that have absolutely no connections, I can just go into the boat box and it'll pop up here. I'm gonna delete this note. That rarely happens. Now, why do I like putting the state of the note down so much? Well, I love it because it lets me know how much a note is embedded inside of my thinking. Because that note, if it's an evergreen note or a fern note, is probably benefited from the Lindy effect and is therefore a foundational part of my knowledge. So now we have distill. Distillation is a process through which I take my fleeting notes and literature notes and distill them down into atomic notes slash settles. I usually don't do this at any particular time except when I'm distilling sources down for my newsletter, Aiden's Infinite Play, which is basically a whole newsletter where I share the coolest things I've learned each week and I also link out to all of my news from the channel so like the most recent YouTube videos and podcasts other important things that have happened so you can check that out if you want to in the description and I believe you should follow efforts over projects when developing ideas you can't put a time or a schedule on note making because thinking requires time instead you should use efforts which are the small actions you take every day or every couple of days to progress towards a goal and this philosophy 
has changed my life. It allows me to organize my notes opportunistically instead of having to know exactly where to link right away. Some days I don't create any notes or zettles at all. Some days I'm particularly inspired and I go on a note making rampage. Like when I made my entire flow state mock, which I showed earlier in a single day after reading Flow, The Psychology of Optimal Experience. It was a good book. If you wanna learn more about how I take book notes in Obsidian, check out my video up above. Organize. How do I know where to link the atomic notes slash zettles I created up above? Well, going back to Lumen's system, I link mainly in four ways. At the top of the note through the up section, in the body of the note, at the bottom of the note in the related section, and then finally under the references section for literature notes where the ideas come from. So to give me insight in how to figure out which notes are related, I personally follow the thinking process of note making by trying to connect my notes with these statements. That reminds me, it's similar because, it's different because, and it's important because. So by just saying that in my head, it often gives me an idea for which note I should connect to what. But I also use a different system, which is something that I first heard from Vicky Zhao and Fei Ling Seng on a Linking Your Thinking Workshop video. You can check out the original video up above. And essentially the way it works is there are north, west, south, and east directions that you can link to, which are associative thinking linking strategies. Wow, that was mouthful. North is where you link to things that the idea comes from. So that's exactly like my up section that I was talking about in my own note. Uh, west is where you link to something that's similar to, to whatever note you have, something that reinforces it. South is where you link to something that this idea can lead to. So it's downstream of the idea. And then East is where you link to something that competes with X, something that's transforming that X into something else. There's a bunch of other questions which you can check right here and you should watch the original video, but I think that's a really helpful way to also think about how you might be able to link notes in your system using the Zettelkasten. Obsidian makes it super easy to do this because I can use the local graph view and backlinks to see connections, which is why I love Obsidian so much. So just to give you an idea, I can literally go to my, let's go to my happiness mock actually. If I go to my happiness mock, I'll go here and boom. You see all these link mentioned? This is where this note right here is mentioned. So just going here, I can jump into another note. This one is on in my meaning mock and this note is linked right here as well. And this meaning mock is linked to a whole bunch of other notes like games of clearly roles in real life, which is also linked to my gamification mock. So as you can see, I'm just hopping around my system with the linked view. So I can link in that way. And this also has the unlinked view, which is kind of insane. Now there's no unlinked mentions here, but sometimes when you go into a note, like I might find some if I go to happiness, there's probably some unlinked mentions there. Wow, this is linked a lot. Oh, is this cause I'm already on the unlinked view? Yeah, here's unlinked mentions. So as you can see, there's 194 unlinked mentions of happiness throughout my vault. And if I wanted to, I could just click the link button right here and it would link to it. So that's another way you could find links. And then there's also the local graph view, which I think is way more useful than the uh, big graph view. Cause the big graph view is terrifying. Local graph view, I have it set up so it shows links away at a depth of two connections. So say I was in happiness is a long-term activity of aligning values with action. While I'm here and I'm thinking of where can I link this to, I might go over to the local graph view and careen around these notes. Like, okay, this is linked to uh, action shapes perception. Is that related to emotion and social psychology? Is it related to tilting means allowing a relevant emotion to influence a decision? Is there some way that I can find links connected to this in the local graph view. So that's another way that I do that in Obsidian. So those are the main ways through which notes come back up again and again. And now the more notes a note is linked to in your system, the more likely it's going to come back again later on and come into one of your articles or something you create. And it's important to realize that the older a note is, the more notes it's probably linked to in your system. And therefore when creating and linking new notes, I try and find a older note to embed them in rather than only connecting them to the old note on the new note. Uh, and that way I'm more likely to find them again. So for instance, if I create a new note that's really relevant to a mock I already have, and I think it's important, I will link it in the mock as well as link it in the up section of the new note. And that way 
I'm more likely to see the mock than I am the new note, which means I'm more likely to have that note come up again later on. And over time, as more and more notes coalesce and the level of disorganization becomes painful, I reach a mental squeeze point and I start collecting notes into a mock. As mentioned earlier, mock's a summary note of other notes. I have an entire video describing how I create mocks, which I mentioned earlier. You can check it up above here. And most important mocks get organized in my home note. So I have tons of other mocks outside of my home note. It's just that the home note is supposed to be the broadest level view. So it only has my most important mocks. Finally, we have Express. Ultimately, the main reason for developing a Zettelkasten system is for expression. This is where the Zettelkasten shines. And as mentioned earlier, the notes in my Zettelkasten form the foundation of my YouTube videos, email newsletter, Aiden's Infinite Play, and my podcast, Personal Knowledge Management with Aiden Helfont. That's because the content created is simply an assemblage of notes in my Zettelkasten. Some of my content is literally just the mocks inside of my system talked about. So expression is the last step, but in many ways, it's also the easiest step. All the thinking's been done during the capturing, distilling, and organizing step. I just have to package it in a cool way. Not every one of your created notes has to be expressed through a published form of content. You can express simply by conversing with other people in your day. What is the Zettelkast and transformation? If you implement the workflow and the mindset of the Zettelkast and for at least two years, I promise your life will change dramatically. Why two years? There's no magical reason. Following through with anything for more than two years is bound to show results of some kind. And I doubt you'll be disappointed if you do. You'll start to see ideas as an interconnected network and conversation between different people. A conversation you can join at any place, wherever your interests lie. Over time, everything will start to make sense. As you can see, map notes, projects, and new ideas forming under the structure of your everyday life. Your mind will change. Learning to work symbiotically with your second brain to draw on resources, references, and research far beyond what it can remember on its own. You become more objective and unattached, knowing if an idea doesn't work out, you have a treasure trove of others ready to go. Your Zettelkasten becomes an externalization of your psychology, a mirror reflecting who you think you are, who you want to be, and who you want to become. Because you have a PCAM workflow, every experience becomes an opportunity to learn and grow. People will notice. They'll see you can draw an unusually large body of knowledge at a moment's notice without realizing you never set purposeful time to remember anything. They'll admire the fluidity and interestingness of your ideas without realizing your Zettelkasten makes them come organically. They'll respect your avid expression without realizing it's so much easier when you never have to start from scratch again. And they will see the genuine joy and curiosity you show towards everything in life. Then they will become curious about what you're doing differently. Finally, they'll make their own PKM journeys. In this way, PKM is not only the art of changing your relationship to information, but changing others as well. Be sure to check out my video on mock creation to learn more about how I capture things in my day. As always, have a fantastic rest of your day and bye-bye.